So, very good morning, everybody. Uh, we will be dealing with a fairly important topic that we encounter in our day-to-do -day practice, and that is understanding FACO fluidics, and most importantly, choosing your machines and settings. So, I will be assisted in this uh, instruction course by Dr. Raghu Krishnan, who will be coming in next. Uh, followed by Dr. Jayang Chushan Gupta and Dr. Sayan Das. So the topics that we will be covering will be understanding the FECO parameters, the jargon of FECO, understanding turbulence, bottle height, its effect and how to minimize it, comparison of peristaltic and venturi pumps, settings in special cases like if I phase zonulysis, PPC, small pupil, etc., and capabilities of entry level and high ended machines and how to decide which machine to buy. We will not be talking about any brands, but we will guide you between the everlasting debate between Venturi and Peristaltic. The purpose of my talk is to explain the terminologies used in connection with FECO machine and to understanding the, understand the basic workings of a FECO machine. So if you break up the FECO machine, it is comprised of a system of flow, a system of aspiration, and a system of ultrasound. So these three parameters work hand in hand to deliver the results of FECO emulsification. The flow is the fluid that enters the eye. It is coming from the infusion bottle and exits through any egress point, which is the side port leakage, the main incision leakage, and leakage from uh, the, the aspiration from the FACO probe. The aspiration is the fluid leaving the eye through the FACO tip during surgery. So aspiration will not include the passive egress of fluid through the side port and main incision leakage. Vacuum is the negative pressure that exists as the aspiration tip, tip which causes the uh, aspiration. Now followability is how quickly the material comes to the FACO tip and it is expressed in cc's per minute. Holdability is how well the material is held at the tip and this is expressed in millimeters of mercury. So holdability is a function of the vacuum. Now we come to flow. The flow, there are two types of flow. One is the passive gravity assisted flow. In the passive system, it is the bottle height which is all important. And for every 15 centimeters or 6 inches of bottle height is equivalent to 11 millimeters of mercury. So, 3 feet of bottle height, 90, is technically 66 millimeters of Hg of intraocular pressure, but accounting for leakage from the ports, it amounts to about 60 millimeters of mercury. The infusion pressure is there in active fluidics, which is there in uh, one of Alcon's uh, machine, in which there is an active pressure used to compress the ir irrigation ba bag so that more fluid is forced into the eye. And they have come up with a uh, parameter called IOP, which is because there is a transducer inside the irrigation system. But this IOP is not intraocular pressure, it is intraoperative pressure. So they'll come and tell you it's, we monitor the IOP and you can set the IOP, it is the intraoperative pressure, because it is assumed that the sensor which is there in the irrigating system will measure the pressure inside the eye also. But that is not true because if the, the entire circuit of aspiration and irrigation is not same diameter. So wherever there is a narrowing of the diameter, there will be a fall in pressure. Inflow dynamics depends on tubic di tubing diameter and sleeve diameter, incision size and architecture, that is how the sleeve is being compressed against the FECO tip by the wound, and the tip sleeve combination. So for smaller FECO tips and sleeve combinations, there are some strategies which are used to compensate for this and that is by creating extra channels of fluid flow besides the tube. But ultimately it is the disparity between the sleeve and the tip which allows the fluid to enter the eye. If you look at the irrigation uh, on a video, you will find that 80% comes from the side, 20% comes from, the, from around the tip. And it is this which cools the tip and it is also tends to drive away small bits of nucleus from the tip. So this works against aspiration. 
coming to aspiration or outflow, outflow includes aspiration and passive egress. So tip diameter, how much of the tip is occluded is the main parameter which determines the aspiration. Tubing diameter and compliance, leakages from the system and the most importantly the pump capacity which is the active component which controls aspiration. So here you have the two systems, Venturi, I will be talking about it in greater detail. Can you turn off the audio please? Right. So in the Venturi, in the peristaltic system it is basically pinch and go, pinch and go, so it is a pulsatile flow. In a venturi, it is a smooth laminar flow. That has to be kept in mind that there is a basic inherent turbulence built into peristaltic machines, especially at lower aspiration flow rates. So as I said, vacuum de uh, determines the holdability of the nucleus. That is, once you have uh, embedded or impaled the nuclear bit, how well it will be held, how less the chatter will be. Whereas the aspiration flow rate it determines the followability, that is even if you are static at one point, how fast the nuclear bits will come to the FECO probe. So rise time is like in cars, 0 to 60 in 5 seconds. So that is that determines the speed at which you can increase the vacuum in your FECO machine. In a peristaltic system, it is important to understand that the occlusion only when occlusion occurs, only then vacuum starts building up. But in Venturi system, as soon as you enter foot position 2, your vacuum is full on. The tubings determine a lot of what happens in your uh, aspiration area. And you will see that the cassettes that we use in Infinity and Centurion, they are peristaltic based, whereas in the Venturi cassette, very little happens inside the cassette. Everything happens in the pump. Inside the cassette, there is only pinching of occlusion and pinching of flow. That's all. The higher compliance uh, FECO tubes were used in the past, silicon tubes. They created mode of surge, which I'll be talking about next. Whereas the more rigid PVC pipes, they're less compliant and therefore less surge. So when you are buying a peristaltic machine, you also have to take a look at why, what the tubing is. If the tubing is silicon, there will be more surge. So surge is an additional source of vacuum which builds up other than the pump because the tip is occluded and the pump is working. So how it works? So like over here, I am impaled the nucleus but it's not impaled properly. When I start chopping, there is little movement and the anterior chamber comes down as soon as the occlusion is released. So Surge is more likely to happen in chopping because there you have higher parameters. So let us take a look at this animated video. So you see that the tube is collapsing here. And when it is collapsing, when it is relaxing as soon as the occlusion is lost, there is an additional vacuum that builds up which draws from the anterior chamber causing it to collapse. So this is a comparison of different uh, uh, pipe uh, tubings and you see that the silicone causes maximum negative pressure and this is translates as the surge and the best is the rigid low compliant tubings which are come by the name of intrepid. Venting is a process which allows you to neutralize residual vacuum. So if you have caught something like iris or posture capsule you don't want and you release your foot switch suddenly there is some reverse flow and the structure is forced away from the tube. Reflux on the other hand is a surgeon initiated venting. Venting is automatic. So if you, there is a sudden release of your foot switch, there will be venting. If there is a gradual, uh, if you have already caught something and you want to release it, then you do a reflux. So chamber stability comes from chamber instability comes from an outflow inflow mis mismatch which is you have incorrect parameters, you have a tip sleeve mismatch, pump characteristics are not correctly set, etc. So this is an experiment we did in which you keep increasing the vacuum and at a relatively lower bottle height and you see that at one time the aspiration outstrips the irrigation and the chamber collapses. We will not be talking much about ultrasound because 
talking about everything, including ultrasound, will make it a very long IC, and any, my time is also up. But basically, there are different types of tips, but we have to, there are two important things. One is the bevel, the diameter, and the angulation. So, if you consider the flatter the tip, the less the angulation, the better the occlusion, the less the efficiency, the broader the tip, the more slanted the tip, the less the occlusion, more the emulsifying power. So it has to be a balance between these two and a 30 degree tip usually does the best. So with that, I'll be handing over to Dr. Raghu who will be talking about bottle height, turbulence, etc. This is not part of the thing, but at the end when we have the time for panel discussion, we will be discussing certain troubleshooting parameters. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Raghu Krishnan, and I thank uh, my co-instructors and chief instructor, Dr. Vaskarai Chaudhary, for giving me the opportunity to play my part here. And uh, thank you, uh, the August audience, for coming on a Sunday morning. So, so before I go on to my brief in this instruction, I, I would like to uh, create an analogy between the FACO machine and the automobile, a motor car. So if we compare the machine with the uh, car, the irrigation of the balance salt solution is equal to the fuel, which, is, which drives the machine. The pump speed is the aspiration flow rate or the vacuum and that is responsible for maneuverability of the motor car in all situations. And the energy, that is the ultrasound in the FACO machine, is analogous to the horsepower of the car. And to uh, cap it all, we have the reflux switch also, which acts as the reverse gear in the motor car. So with this analogy in mind, I think uh, that should take us uh, through the through my brief, we go on to the main portion, uh, my, my part of the course, which, is, which talks about the turbulence, the bottle height, and the optimization of the about two factors. So yeah, the chamber stability. What we find is that the chamber is going to be stable if the inflow is equals the outflow. Rather, the inflow should be a little more than the outflow so that the the chamber is stable. If the outflow exceeds the inflow, then the chamber is going to collapse and that is going to make fake emulsification difficult for all of us. In this particular video, what we find is that the side port is a little larger than normal. So there's a leak from the side port which, may, which creates shallowing in the anterior chamber. With the result, what is happening here is that the uh, rectus is extended because of instability of the anterior chamber. So here the outflow was more than the inflow which caused this particular event to occur. So when we talk about the dynamics of the irrigation, most of the uh, FACO machines, we have a gravity fed system as Dr. Baskar referred to. And uh, typically we are talking about the bottle height above the eye level. Normally, uh, most surgeons keep the bottle height above the eye level at about 60 centimeters, which translates to about 45 millimeters of mercury. The uh, centurion machine of Alcon, though, works on a different principle uh, on the basis of pressure sensor, though now they have also added the gravity fed system to their repertoire. Yeah, it's important that the flow of the fluid in the anterior chamber is proper and laminar because a turbulent flow would lead to damage to the intraocular structures. Here is a video about how clear the lamina flow is. This sort of makes the process of phaco emulsification and aspiration very comfortable. And a turbulent flow on the other hand would cause A 
And the turbulent flow, on the other hand, would cause a lot of fluid noise inside the anterior chamber, causing a lot of damage to the iris and the anterior capsule and the corneal endothelium. So it's essential to have a proper, uh, proper lamellar flow in the anterior chamber, and uh, the sleeve orientation is equally important here. Just a wet lab demonstration of the orientation of the openings in the sleeve. If the openings in the sleeve are not horizontal, then the fluid jet would be damaging both the iris as well as the corneal endothelium. So this is a more optimal way of keeping the uh, openings in the sleeve. And uh, as Dr. Bhaskar referred to, alluded to the types of pumps, yeah, there are two types, periscarding and venturi. The venturi the, is, is like a motor car which uh, speeds from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in 10 seconds. So we need to be a little careful here. And the vacuum rises faster in venturi system. And because the vacuum rises faster, once the occlusion is broken, then the, uh, the surge in the anterior chamber is that much more in the venturi fed system than the peristaltic system. And uh, quickly going over the uh, modes of phaco emulsification, longitudinal and torsional. And uh, over a period of time, most surgeons have their own settings. They have optimized as per their habits and attitudes, depending upon the, uh, the phaco emulsification, the type of the density of the nucleus, the irrigation aspiration, and the capsule polish parameters. So how does all this, the turbulence, the bottle height, and uh, the optimization of these factors, how do they help in real-time situations? Here we have a very uh, dense cataract. Here is a 60-year-old male. And the lens thickness is about 5.5 millimeters. And uh, the anterior chamber is shallow, and there is an incipient angle closure happening here. So here, what we have done is, if we look at the video, So this is, a, this is that patient. Here we have a bottle height about 60, 65 centimeters above the eye level. And the side port is nice and uh, imperforate so that there's no leakage and the main wound is good enough. So the anterior chamber is stable. And despite the thick lens and the shallow anterior chamber, the surgery goes on well. The next one is a young lady, 42-year-old uh, lady with uh, cataracts in both the eyes. And uh, dense posterior uh, subcapsular. So uh, we ended up doing OCT and we found that there is a little bit of probably a little bit of breach in the posterior capsule. So we were very careful at the outset so that we probably thought that we are dealing with a posterior polar cataract here. And uh, here how we optimize, go about optimization is that here the bottle height this is not the normal 60 centimeters. We have reduced the bottle height to about 45 centimeters, which translates to about 30 millimeters of mercury pressure. And we have also reduced the vacuum parameters and ensured that the anterior chamber doesn't shallow. All this sort of translates into, this sort of prevents the excessive pressure on the posterior capsule, and the posterior capsule integrity is maintained. And uh, so with, by optimizing these parameters, we have ended up doing a, a successful fake emulsification with the lens implantation. And then we have these extraordinary situations wherein what happens is that despite all the optimization, we, we sort of overlook some very basic factors like a tight speculum. So despite your uh, uh, bottle height, uh, laminar flow, uh, we, we find that there is this iris prolapse out here, which probably is caused by a tight speculum. So these extraneous factors also should not be overlooked. And uh, that sort of sums up my presentation. Thank you very much, my dear audience, and Dr. Vasco Rai Thank you. So if you have any questions, we can uh, take them in between also. Otherwise, we will proceed to the next presentation. Not this one, the next one. Arup Kumar Bose. Yeah. Huh? No, no, no. The next one. Presentation number three.
It's here, no? Yeah. <coughs> Good. So now we will be dealing with peristaltic and venturi pumps in greater detail, especially with regard to the parameters. And this is the single most important question that we usually have when we are buying a machine, whether we should go for a peristaltic system or a venturi system. Now, there's a question I'd like to ask all of you that uh, have you ever considered why vitrectomy machines are all venturi, even those manufactured by Alcon or others who swear by their peristaltic machines for FECO, vitrectomy machines are invariably venturi. It is because whatever has been taught to us conventionally, vitrectomy requires much less turbulence and much finer control and that can be given only by a venturi system. So there are two basic factors responsible for lens materials to come to the, your FACO tip, and that is the aspiration flow rate, or AFR, and the vacuum. So the Venturi pump is basically based on Venturi effect, which is derived from Bernoulli's equation. I will not go into the detail, but the main uh, uh, thing that we need to know is that when fluid comes from a uh, broader area into a narrower area, there is a drop in pressure. And this drop in pressure actually sucks fluid out from any tube that you attach over there. So that is the basic working of a venturi pump. A peristaltic pump, on the other hand, works by pinch and rollers, and therefore it depends on flow. So these are flow-based pumps, Why, whereas venturi pumps are vacuum-based pumps. So like I said, the moment you go into foot position two, you have the vacuum build up in the anterior chamber in a venturi-based system. So that is what determines the rise time. So ideally, because the moment you enter foot position two, you have full vacuum in a venturi, so the rise time should be very fast in a venturi system. But that is not necessarily true because the, the device, the VRT, which controls the flow of gas can be set to fastest, fast, moderate, and slow. So you don't get the fine grain uh, continuous control that you gain in peristaltic machines, but you can control the rise time in venturi machines also to a certain extent. So once the preset vacuum is reached, the flow rate and vacuum cannot be dissociated in a venturi pump. This is important to know. In a peristaltic pump, you can dissociate the aspiration flow rate from the vacuum. In a venturi pump, you cannot do that. So what does, how does the venturi pump control the vacuum? Then the flow rate in a venturi pump becomes a function of the tip diameter and the leakage from the anterior chamber. So if you have a comparison in uh, between the, uh, vac the flow rate of a venturi pump, then at 300 millimeters of mercury, the flow rate is about 77.7, .7 and it, at about 500, it rises up to 102. So you see that as for the same settings, that is the same uh, uh, tip diameter and the same amount of leakage from the anterior chamber, the more vacuum you give, the faster things will move. So this cannot be dissociated in a venturi pump, and this is the primary source of fear that we have, because we cannot make things slow while having a high vacuum, like in a peristaltic pump. So the advantages of a peristaltic pump is that the vacuum limits can be set independent of flow. The pump allows a moderately high flow with a low vacuum or a low flow with a high vacuum, which, is, which basically increases the comfort of a beginner surgeon. But once you have your parameters in control and your FECO machine in control, a venturi pump will probably give you more leverage for your time. The disadvantages of a peristaltic pump is that you have to keep in mind two separate fluidic parameters and there is more for the surgeon to understand. The vacuum buildup is slower and it is stepped because, as I said, the venturi pump is by nature turbulent and pulsatile. And the vacuum buildup is directly related to the density of occlusion. So if there is no occlusion at the tip, there is no vacuum buildup in the anterior chamber, which will not do well for followability because then, unless there is something pulling the bits towards your FECO tip, you have to go and get them. So one has to mechanically approach the fragment to, uh, for the vacuum to build up and then use FECO emulsification. The advantage of a venturi is there's a single parameter that you have to keep in mind, vacuum, and that is you have to adjust your foot, uh, foot movement and your hand movement to a single parameter. It is not occlusion dependent, so followability will be higher. Nuclear and cortical matter will be attracted towards your FECO tip and your, your uh, surgical time will be much less. 
the disadvantage is, is only the vacuum can be controlled. So if there are rare situations in which there is an iris flutter in which you want to keep the flow rate low without reducing the vacuum, that you have to do in a peristaltic, in a venturi pump through more careful foot control. So it requires more skill. And the last point that uh, the higher vacuums, if you work at higher vacuums, then your bottle heights are higher compared to a peristaltic pump because uh, it is only the flow that will determine the stability of the anterior chamber. So for central sculpting and sculpting and trenching, the fluidic objective is that the tip should not get embedded in the nucleus and the flow rate should be enough just to gather the debris, the emulsified debris that you're creating and will not cause movement of the nucleus. So you need a low vacuum, moderate flow, which is possible only in a peristaltic pump and to a certain extent in a venturi pump as well. So once again, venturi pumps will be used mostly by uh, senior surgeons, experienced surgeons who will be mostly doing direct chop or stop and chop. In chopping, the fluidic objective is to impale the nucleus and to mobilize it against the incoming chop and the tip must be able to grip more and more strongly. So the vacuum is much more important. Here the flow rate is not important. But surge protection is important because when the chop is over, there's a break in occlusion, there should not be any surge. So what is not desirable, as you can see in the video on your left, is it is not desirable that the nucleus should rotate. So this is happening because the grip on the nucleus is not as good as it is in the right side of your frame where the nucleus is absolutely rock stable once you impale it. This is because the vacuum buildup is much, much better. In quadrant removal, the fluidic objective is to increase the force with which the attractive force with which it will come to your tip and you have, should have adequate phaco power so that your operative time becomes less and over here also the venturi pump is performs better even in inexperienced hands because you don't have to move out of the safe zone to approach the nuclear bits. In epinucleus or last fragment removal, a peristaltic pump will be preferred because, and this is really where a peristaltic pump will do much better than a venturi pump because over here flow rate, reducing the flow rate, reducing the speed at which things happen is very important because you are no longer guarded by bits of nucleus which will keep the capsule away. In cortex aspiration, both machines will function equally well because it's a bimanual cortical aspiration. The chamber is absolutely stable and you can, there is very little you can do other than pull at the capsule which will cause a PC rent or a zonulysis. So to sum up, peristaltic is better for the less experienced surgeon, but as you gather experience and you gather patients and you have more surgeries to do in OT, a peristaltic pump will slow you down. There a venturi pump will be much better. So venturi pumps will actually be safer than peristaltic pumps in experienced hands. Thank you. Now Dr. Jayangshu will be uh, speaking about uh, settings in difficult situations like IFIS or uh, posterior polar cataracts, small pupils, etc. Thank you. Uh, so, when we had, uh, when I had started my uh, FECO journey, uh, I was like exposed to both the peristaltic and the venturi machines, and I was bought over with the speed of the venturi machines uh, but later on uh, as years passed with the new generation of peristaltic machines i found that it's a perfect balance of speed and safety which adds to my practice right now i'm using a, a centurion vision system uh, to perform my surgeries 
So over the last two decades, there have been major conceptual shifts which have been uh, highlighted now and again uh, in the previous talks, like we have from longitudinal to torsional, we have uh, power modulation from waveform to hyperpulse, we have the anti-surge algorithms, we have the high flow, uh, uh, high vacuum flow restrictive tubings, we have the dual linear pedals, we have the uh, pedals, the, we have the progressive reduction in, in incision size. However, the end result has been basically a shift from power-driven surgery to a fluid-driven surgery. And there comes the concept of the target IOP or the active fluidics, and it concentrates on a, a more efficient energy delivery system so that we can perform a surgery delivering lower energy using a higher vacuum at the same time maintaining a zero turbulence or a low turbulence. So as we said, it's a target-driven uh, irrigation system, and there is a post-occlusion uh, passive surge protection mechanism, which limits the post-occlusion surge uh, pressure changes to a drop of less than around 30 millimeter mercury. And if we go for the comparison of the target bottle height and uh, the target intraoperative pressure and the bottle height, we see that uh, uh, while the target IRP is around 80, the bottle height is around 110. Usually people stay in the range of the 80s and 90s, so it, equivalent, uh, it is equivalent to a target intraoperative pressure of 60s and 70s, whereas uh, uh, the target IRP can, be, can go down as low as 20, which is equivalent to a bottle height of around 27, but with majority of the peristaltic machines, we can lower down to a level of around 50. So the elements of control in our hand are basically the IOP or the bottle light, whatever I'm using, the vacuum and aspiration, the irrigation factor. I'm not a, a, I'm not a, a scientist, I'm not, I do not understand uh, machines in general. What I understand is, is does it per serve my purpose? Does it give me safety? Does it give me comfort? Does it ensure the safety of the patient? Does it affect the outcome? So this is, this is uh, something uh, I'm more, I will be more neutral to my approach when I will be uh, handling the uh, cases. So setting up the star, uh, target IRP, we can have a standard IRP of around 55 uh, millimeter, which uh, can be lowered with a regular research to around 40 to 45 millimeter mercury. And where it is important is by lowering the IRP, by lowering the intraoperative pressure, we are actually uh, maintaining the uh, lower pressure on the optic nerves, which can have an effect as we know that uh, we have a snuff out phenomenon in a, a, a moderately damaged uh, optic nerve in, uh, high, in glaucomatous patients. So taking care of the intraoperative pressure is probably one of the, uh, one of the parameters and right now uh, intraoperative uh, sensors in the tip are also being uh, considered so that uh, it gives a better sensation system, as highlighted by Bhaskada, that it is a total tubing system. Uh, it, the sensor is outside the eye, so it is, a, it is a system, it is the pressure throughout the system. Now this similarly, this lowering of the intraoperative pressure, intraoperative pressure as you say, uh, can be also helpful in the myopic and the vitrectomized eyes, because it can prevent a painful uh, reverse pupillary block. And then what it transpires into, because of the pressure sensors, because of the fluid actively driven into the eye, we have a less uh, turbulence inside the anterior chamber and we know that the more the turbulence, there will be more amount of endothelial cell loss. And so we have a, as a result, we have a more stable relation between the lens and the iris diaphragm and a less stress on the zonules. Now if you remember, uh, let us take the example of our fuchs dystrophy. Fuchs dystrophy around 2006, 2007, if we have one parameter as a cutoff as the corneal thickness, the cutoff was around 600, 600 micron, apart from the other parameters. Though it's an absolute value, people may uh, contradict, but that was the reported data. Then over the next decade, the thickness increased to 640. So we are able to do in a worser cornea more comfortably. And probably with advent of newer machines, we can further increase our corneal thickness cutoff and give rise, and we, can, may, we may avert a uh, corneal transplantation. So basically, this concept adds to our spectrum of cases, the PPCs, the fuchs above the 640 micron cutoff, if we take it, the floppy iris syndrome, the small pupils, the ZDs, and so on. 
We have another important factor in this uh, system that is the irrigation factor, which actually compensates for the uh, leakage. And instead of increasing the bottle height or increasing the IOP, we can change the irrigation factor in situations like where we have a shallow or a flat anterior chamber, we have the post PI or we have an inadvertent uh, leaky wound, a very hard cataract, uh, uh, the post R case, the corneal transplant situations. And we can also decrease it uh, rather than decreasing the bottle height in myopic or vitrectomized dyes. So apart from it, we have a control over the vacuum and aspiration. It is linear or fixed in fifth position two, and it, is, it can be fixed in foot position three, or it can be uh, decreasing in foot position three to reduce the surge, or we can increase in foot position three for a better grab and uh, reholding and repositioning. So in general, what happens is uh, tw we can achieve a 20% uh, higher vacuum with a reduction of with a 20% reduction of uh, AFR and an average average energy reduction of 40%. So this basically this is reported in 2015 and this basically transpires into the safety as well as the outcome of the patient. Now, irrespective of whatever I am using, whatever machine I have or whatever situation I am, I am in, I want a good hold irrespective of the softness. I want to ensure followability. I do not understand machines. I want to ensure followability. I want a stable anterior chamber. I want a fast but not furious, rather safe. I want a reduced CD. I want a reduced turbulence. I want a constant pupillary size. I want predictability. So I have a host of demands when I will enter into my surgery. So we will have our first case, uh, which is a situation of a posterior polar cataract. Uh, and uh, just like uh, anybody, like my thought process is like when I see a banana skin, I know that I will sleep again, I will have a fall. So when I have a PPC, I know I'm going to land up in trouble, like curse people, like get angry on the retina surgeons, why they're born. But if you see, we have reduced the IOP, we have reduced the aspiration flow rate, yet we are able to maintain a higher vacuum with a stable anterior chamber. And as we start off the process, it's a softer cataract, so we just uh, initiate a primary uh, crap without opening the window much and take out the pieces one after the other. So when we are looking into the settings, we must understand that irrespective of whatever I keep, I may have a vacuum of 650, 700. How many times do I reach that? So all of us have a sweet spot. And it is whatever be the setting, we ultimately land up in that sweet spot irrespective of what we keep as our base and the high. So reaching that sweet spot in every case is probably the most important thing. And as we see that we could uh, peel off the cases and we replenish the chamber with the visco. We do some uh, visco uh, dissection of the uh, epinucleus and from all the sides because this helps to, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this helps to probably uh, reduce the uh, chamber, uh, maintain the chamber stability. And then as I peel off the epinuclear plate, I see there is a rent underneath. So this is the advantage of a lower setting, a control setting, where I am able to grab hold, I am able to aspirate, I am able to do everything without chattering, without a fluctuation of the antra chamber. And then with the help of additional uh, installation of visco, I can I can aspirate the uh, remaining pieces as, my, as I thought that my visco content in the chamber was going down, so I needed to replenish it. So I have a rent, I have a central dehiscence, it is still under control at this point of time. And then we can go in for the uh, bimanual cortical aspiration at the same time. And we see that we have a spindle-shaped rent within the central part my, my equator is more or less clear. I can put in more visco. I can carry out some uh, antivitrectomy. And ultimately, once the thing is control, uh, com uh, completed, I can put a lens inside the bag. So this sort of settings helps us to reduce the size of the rent, prevent a nucleus drop, prevent a uh, prevent a drop of the cortical matter by controlling the procedure intraoperatively. My next case is just another PPC. So 
the look said there's a 100% guarantee of everything happening. And this was a relatively harder cataract. The initial trench was made. I tried to separate, not uh, very aggressive. I go ahead with the pieces. I rotate with a lot of caution. And then we go ahead with emulsification of the pieces, one after the another. And then, as my pieces are coming in, I'm sure nothing is there at this point of time. And then when I try to rotate, I see something. There is a clearance. I think there is a rent, but I'm not sure whether there is a rent. There should be a rent. So that piece also comes up. I cannot see anything underneath. My epinuclear plate is well in position. So I replenish with visco. And as I go for my traditional technique of putting in viscoelastic under an epinuclear plate, I find the iris is coming down out. So I am sure that there is a rent. Because, because of the rent, the visco goes down, gives a positive pressure, and the epinuclear comes out. So in spite of that, I can continue with my process. I can uh, control my uh, rent size. I can take out the epinuclear plate as, a, as, an, uh, as demanded. So I rotate the epinuclear plate, and we take it out, though we know that there is a there is a uh, dehiscence underneath. So instead of, but this is what we understand by good hold, good followability, good vacuum, and uh, safety. So once this is over, we we'll just put it forward. We do the uh, cortical cleanup as we normally do. And then we put a lens in the sulcus, a multipus lens in the sulcus, because the range was relatively bigger. Uh, I couldn't put a lens in the uh, back. So the third case is, again, another case. I call it, why do they happen to me always? So this was another PPC. Jangshu, do you have a um, small pupil or if his video? I have. Then I think we can skip to that. OK. Uh, why I want to uh, show this particular video is because in sp this was a harder nucleus. In spite of doing the uh, procedure, we had a intact posterior capsule. And after that, we have done everything. We have saved the capsule. But then, as I was aspirating, I found the capsule dehiscence. And this is where I observed that I had kept my bottle head at 60. So lowering the intraoperative pressure is also important, and a rent can happen anytime. I think uh, my, this video is an intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. So here also, I believe I use a common setting. I do not like to change my settings. I prefer uh, a safe setting, which gives me the entire spectrum of cases. So this was, I gave the intracam. Uh, and achieved the, uh, the viscomidriasis. Now, traditionally, in floppy iris syndrome, we are habituated to using the heavier viscoelastics like helon and et cetera. But uh, because, I have a, uh, because I'm using a lower settings in such situations, I can manage the situation with a normal HPMC also. Now, I perform the anterior capsular rexis, which I prefer it anterior to the pupillary margin so that when I'm doing the hydrodization, the the uh, nucleus doesn't uh, pop out, and uh, it will increase the chances of the iris coming out of the wound or the side port. So once it is done, I do a hydro dissection, because this is also an important aspect of fluidics, I believe, and uh, to get the uh, set ready before I enter into the surgery. And I see the iris is coming out uh, from my main wound. So I do a multipoint hydro delineation, uh, small aliquots of uh, fluid into the different aspect, different areas of the nucleus. And then as I put my iris back, I uh, see that uh, I put the subincisional viscoelastic, and I see that I have achieved a decent enough uh, had, uh, 
uh, hydrodelineation. So once I start off the procedure, there is a classic bellowing of the iris and the diaphragm, but that is the time I take for the stabilization of the intraoperative pressure and the pupillary size. So once my pupillary size is maintained, I can initiate the crack, and this is at a bottle height of around uh, 60 centimeter of uh, mercury. So there is nothing much in the su uh, surgery, only it shows that there is a minimum amount of turbulence and we can carry out the procedure while maintaining the uh, uh, iris in its position. And finally, we can have a situation like this where we can just uh, have a proper bed for the uh, intraocular lens implantation. After that, uh, I think I have uh, another video of a post arc This is interesting because uh, we do get people, this is a 24-cut uh, arc and uh, I did not have a position for the wound, so I was all scared about uh, which one will open up uh, during my surgery. And I have reduced the intraoperative pressure further to 36. My flow rates are further reduced. My vacuum, I again reach my sweet spot, and I can do a, basically I can do a FECO rolling. So re this actually reduces the maneuvers inside the chamber and prevents me from opening, uh, from an inadvertent opening up of any of the RK cuts which I can have, and then I can flip the nucleus and just emulsify the pieces. So, this is the post RK. Then we have, uh, I think, this is a. This was a case of uh, higher, uh, this was a case of advanced glaucomatous damage where we have reduced the IOP to around uh, 20 millimeter mercury, uh, 20 millimeter mercury, and we can see that in such situations also we have a very good hold, we have a very good crack, we have a stable chamber, and we can carry out the process uh, without any issues, without any trouble. My next case is a case of uh, a gross zonular laxity, uh, diffuse. I heard it on the table that the, in between while waiting for the surgery, the patient had had a fall like uh, some three weeks uh, back. And there was a, a difficulty in performing the rexis because the zonules were weak. I thought I will carry out the procedure at 20 millimeter mercury. But when I started doing the procedure, I found that the nucleus is popping up from its position because there is no zonular support. So I just uh, changed my settings to my, again to my uh, 46 and uh, I can carry out the procedure and in the end we can, we just put in a CTR and we could put in a lens. The last case is probably, this is probably the last case uh, which is a post DLK cataract surgery, not much of a cataract in it, so uh, I will just skip it. So to summarize, we have such special situations like glaucoma, myopia, post vitrectomy, diabetes. It is not important what we are keeping. Machines give us the opportunity to explore. Machines give us the opportunity to understand. However, grossly speaking, reducing the intraocular pressure, reducing the bottle height, with appropriate reduction in vacuum and aspiration without compromising our individual comfort level will give rise to successful outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Jayangshu. This There were very compelling videos. So next on is uh, <coughs> Dr. Shayan Das. And he'll be covering the most important topic today, which machine do I buy? And I can see his boss sitting in the audience. So his life depends on what he says over here. A very good morning. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. BRC and AIOC for giving me the opportunity to be part of this IC. So I'll be talking about uh, the FECO machines, their major features, and I'll be restricting my talk to the major players in the market currently. And I have no final, um, financial interests uh, in any of the products mentioned. So I'll be starting with the Alcon machines. Uh, we have the Laureate as a lower end machine from Alcon. It has a peristaltic pump, gravitational infusion, and we can use the laureate or the infinity handpiece with it. It has the standard longitudinal power with hyperpulse and burst modes. It has optical vacuum sensor, and it's a po relatively portable machine. Coming to the infinity, one of the most used machines probably with, in the ophthalmic community uh, in India, 
We know it has a peristaltic pump and a gravitational infusion, and it has this uh, trademark uh, ozil torsional power, and the torsional power helps in increasing followability and the energy is utilized in the entire cycle of the tip movement, and not only in the forward movement of the tip. It also added the feature of intelligent FACO later on with the ozil, and it uh, keeps the lens material in the shearing plane for emulsification and thus reducing chattering. It offers the hyperpulse and the burst modes for both the torsional and the longitudinal FACO settings. And it has the FMS, the intrepid fluid management system, where as Dr. BRC had mentioned, it has rigid tubings and a higher rate of vacuum sensing, which reduces post-occlusion surge. Coming to the uh, latest from the Alcon, we have the Centurion. Uh, the key feature is it has a pressurized infusion for IOP control and it has a peristaltic pump. It has active fluidics, that is it stabilizes chamber by maintaining IOP during aspiration rate fluctuation. And we can see that it has dual pressure sensors both in the irrigation and the aspiration line, which helps in maintaining target, uh, the target IOP. Now, it is uh, recommended uh, that we should use the balance tip with the, Ozil, uh, with the Centurion machine and the balance tip has an extra bend, as we can see, as compared to the uh, Kelman. And uh, that is supposed to increase the movement at the tip itself and reduce movement of the shaft, thus uh, reducing heat generation at the wound. And an additional feature of Centurion is the user interface allows separate control of both the vacuum and the flow rate in both foot position two and foot position three separately. Now coming to uh, Johnson & Johnson vision, which was previously known as uh, Abbott, and it has uh, 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 recently launched the intuitive version of Compact, and this has the peristaltic pump. They have what they call the proactive IOP management with automatic occlusion sensing, and it has, as we know, the ellipse FX handpiece, which has a transversal movement in addition to the longitudinal movement, which they say increases the power utilization efficiency and reduces heat generation at the incision. The higher end machine from Johnson & Johnson is the White Star Signature Pro, and it has a combination of both the peristaltic and the venturi, and it has also the combination pump. It has the proactive IOP management with automatic occlusion sensing and the ellipse FX handpiece. So this is the work, working interface of the um, uh, Signature Pro. The peristaltic, they say, is, as we know, uh, helps in holdability and intraoperative control. And the Venturi allows followability and improve efficiency. And what they recommend is on-demand trans transition while we go into the various steps of the FACO so that we have efficiency at every step. They have the stand, their trademark power modulation called ICE, in which there is an initial kick in the, pul in the power pulse configuration, and they say they, that improves the power efficiency of the machine. They have two uh, fluidic settings uh, or fluidic uh, modification. One is called the occlusion mode FACO, and the other is called CASE. In occlusion mode FACO, the, fluid, uh, the uh, flow rate and the power settings can be uh, preset for both before occlusion and after occlusion. And for case, what's also called the chamber stabilization environment, what happens is uh, during occlusion, when the preset vacuum is reached for a certain period of time, it go the vacuum goes back to a predefined level. And when the occlusion is cleared, then the vacuum goes back to the preset level as set by the surgeon. And occlusion mode and case can both work independently or they can be uh, used together and which they call is, uh, as as uh, fusion fluidics. Then coming to the Bosch and Long machine, the Stellaris, which allows us to operate at with uh, 1.8 millimeter incisions and it has the vacuum pump. They have what is called a stable chamber tubing which allows increase of vacuum while reducing flow and they have uh, the attune handpiece as they call it with uh, advanced waveform modulation providing faster cutting rate and optimizing cutting and cavitation and reducing energy delivery in the anterior chamber. They also have this zero FACO handpiece with 30 degree tip 
perfume to second FECO. The key feature of uh, Boschelnum is probably the double linear foot switch, which provides uh, independent control of power and aspiration. With the vertical movement of the, um, uh, the foot switch, we can uh, use, uh, you can apply power or the vacuum. And with the horizontal movement of the foot switch, we can use the other one. Bosch and Lom has also come up with uh, the Stellaris Elite, sorry for the spelling mistake, and that is have, uh, and uh, they ha uh, it has what is called the adaptive fluidics which monitors the vacuum and the flow rate continuously. It also has something called DG flow or the dynamic infusion conf compensation, something like active fluidics from uh, Alcon, from Centurion, and it adjusts the infusion pressure accordingly. Coming to the Overtly uh, basket, uh, it has the Catarx3, uh, the lower end machine. It has a peristaltic pump and its uh, USP is its portability. It can be attached to the IV pole. It does not require any float space. And the machine and the foot switch easily fits into one single carry case. It has what is called an embedded technology, not dependent on the PC software. So there is um, almost a complete elimination of risk of software malfunction. Another key feature of Catarx3 and the other higher end machine from Wortley is the Easy FECO. That is, it has a wide irrigation uh, path, high vacuum, a capillary flow right at the point where the aspiration line starts, which avoids clogging and prevents surge down the uh, aspiration flow line. And it has the actually directed FECO concentrated to the material held by the FECO tip. It also has what is called the occlusion mode FECO and it has a pneumatic anterior vitrectomy. It also has an additional features of radio frequency capsulotomy and uh, an HFDS as they call it for deep sclerectomy. Feros is an uh, intermediate machine from Ortley and probably its key feature is the foot switch which allows additional controls of the IV pole height and others. Then we have the OS4 and which is called the high definition dynamic, di which has the high definition dynamic direct control of the various parameters. It has a combination of venturi and peristaltic pump and the infusion can be gravity based or gas pressure based. Coming to the uh, indigenous machines from Upper Sami Associates and I strongly believe their contribution to Indian ophthalmology is always underestimated. Uh, they have the Prince which is a portable and a peristaltic machine. They have the Galaxy Pro P, which is a peristaltic machine, and they have a Galaxy Pro V, which, is, which has a Venturi pump. Now coming to the most important uh, slide, the market share according to the units uh, sold in the Indian market, the national market, and this is a personal communication. And interestingly, this personal communication is from a person who was uh, or has recently quit from the senior management position of Alcon, and I think uh, the, uh, the figures are relatively unbiased. So we see that uh, the entry level uh, machines occupy almost 50% of the market and uh, only 10% of the market is uh, occupied by the premium level machines which are costing more than 40 lakhs. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Shayan. Could you please take a seat at the dais? The rest of the panel, please come up to the dais. Jayangshu. Can I have the part two of my first presentation? So it is... Uh, very interesting that uh, higher level, high-ended machines occupy only 10% of the market share, but uh, almost all presentations, 90% of the presentations in the conference are dominated by high-ended machines. Uh, one thing we have to keep in mind when we are uh, buying a FECO machine is the continuing expense in terms of uh, the cassettes, tubings, whether the cassette is reusable, whether you need to change tubings every time, the cost of the handpiece, uh, whether you are autoclaving handpieces every time. So there are a host of other parameters will, which will determine whether uh, which machine you will buy because the upfront payment is not the only payment. The continuing expense also contributes a lot. The second part I would like to point out uh, after all these presentations is that uh, normally we don't keep changing parameters from case to case. You do that initially when the company people are around, but as Joang Shu was pointing out, we all settle down to one settings which covers it all. And that is wrong. But we do it all the time. I do it, he does it. Uh, 
you should have different settings and you should try different set settings and uh, you should uh, read books, uh, attend CMEs and devise your own settings instead of depending only on the company people. Because many times they don't have adequate technological knowledge to guide you. They have just do it blindly. Uh, so I'll be covering some parts of the troubleshooting and then we will uh, have uh, questions from you. So in sculpting, if there is problem, the target is to use more power because you don't want to rock the nucleus, you just want to sculpt. And you don't want to hold the nucleus to avoid stressing the zonules. So sculpting, make sure that the power is at least 40% or more. In a chop, the inability to keep the nucleus held, which is the most common uh, trouble that happens during a chopping, it is mostly due to incorrect technique. That is, you have not embedded it properly, I have not embedded it properly and I am trying to chop. The nucleus is going to slip away, rotate and there can be surge. That can also result if the vacuum setting is too low, if you are tentative and you are not uh, going to your preset vacuum. If you release it too early before the chop is com completed and you can consider having a fixed vacuum so that it's either on or off. And the bevel of the tip, it should be 30 to 45 degrees should not be a very uh, uh, very highly beveled tip then it will not you will have to go more distance into the nucleus to embed it <coughs> bubbles and cavitation is a very common feature that we have and it's a disturbing feature because repeatedly you have to clear the anterior chamber of bubbles and it is because the energy is uh, being applied before the embedding has occurred so if you apply energy in the anterior chamber it will immediately result in bubbles but most often bubbles are retained during priming and tuning. So when priming, the assistant has to keep the tip vertical and above the eye level. Otherwise, uh, bubbles coming in during surgery will happen more. Uh, leaking irrigation line from a handpiece after priming and tu tubing, or if you open it to take fluid for other purposes and then again put it back, you are introducing air bubble into the system. So that should not be done. In a quad removal, if you have low foliability, then uh, you, uh, if you have used viscoat, uh, particularly viscoat, not so much with helon, viscoat tends to clog the, uh, the tip. Same with vitreous. If you have vitreous, then you cannot do FECO because your tip will get clogged. A low aspiration flow rate or vacuum and venturi, the tip diameter, use higher vacuum for narrower tips. And in a venturi system, use a narrower tip with a higher vacuum setting because there is no question of the aspiration flow rate increasing. So in quad removal, you potentially use higher parameters. In peristaltic machines, the tip diameter remains the same, but the sleeve diameter changes. So this is very important. If you are doing a 2.2 in a Alcon machine and a 2.2 in a Bosch and Lom machine, the tip diameters are different. In a Bosch and Lom machine, to compensate for the high vacuum, the tip diameter is actually reduced so that there is less of flow in the chamber. Whereas in a Alcon machine, it is the combination of the tip and sleeve diameter that is reduced. The tip diameter remains the same. So they devise additional strategies to ensure that fluid flows in spite of the tip diameter remaining the same and the sleeve diameter being less. These things are often not highlighted by the company people. If you are having too much chatter, that is repulsion of the nuclear fragment from the FECO tip while you are uh, emulsifying it, it, it is usually due to a mismatch between FECO power and holding power. So you have too much power, especially in longitudinal FECO, and longitudinal FECO has a jackhammer effect which tends to move the piece away. So you have too much power, too much of force moving it away, and too less of holding power. This can result in chatter. So chatter is traditionally less in torsional FECO and to reduce chatter in uh, traditional FECO, use less power with relatively higher vacuum or flow rate. Turbulence, especially during the last phase, as Raghu was saying, turbulence is not only uh, something that damages the endothelium or damages the uh, iris. It is also something that makes your FECO more difficult because the the, the bits of nucleus, the cortex, it does not flow into your aspirating system. So if there is too much of turbulence during removal of the last piece, you can go down to the epinucleus mode, that is lower settings, and do it slowly. 
sometimes we change the tip orientation, especially in Kelman, so that you are not deep down and the tip is pointed towards the side. Although, if you are doing that, you should also change the orientation of your sleeves. The direction of the irrigation flow should not be towards the endothelium. And using the fluid to guide uh, the last bit towards the tip. So you can have a slight swiveling motion, uh, rotating motion of the FECO uh, tip, which will the guide the fluidics in such a way that it will come to your tip. Nuclear bits behind the iris, lost to view, very common, very dangerous because next day it will be saying good morning to you. So do not allow direct flow behind the iris. This will cause pupillary const constriction and zonular disturbance. Do not take the tip below the iris, never ever. The FECO tip should be always visible, even with low vacuum because the vacuum, the diameter of the phago tip is much larger and even at lower vacuums, a floppy structure like iris will invariably enter. So you should never ever chase it. You can use the side port instrument to tease it away or uh, from behind while you have lower parameters and you are closer to the chip. Wound burn is caused by heat transfer to the main incision due to inadequate dissipation of heat. It can happen due to when the heat generation is far out of proportion to the cooling power. And it can happen if you are using a high frequency, hand, uh, low frequency handpiece, increased stroke length, increased duty cycle, or in continuous mode, long, difficult phacos. But more commonly, it will happen if the flow around the tip and the separation of the slip from the tip is not adequate, especially if you have a leak in the sleeve from where the heat will come out. An occlusion for larger chunks of a very hard nucleus for a long time using very high power sleeve tip mismatch and too tight incision. These are the common causes of wound burn. We should also differentiate wound burn from hydration. Hydration is something which occurs if you have a sleeve break in the region of the uh, wound or if you are uh, repeatedly coming to your uh, irrigation ports are coming into the wound repeatedly, then you will have hydration. Hydration color is different. Wound burn is a slightly grayish in color. And there is gaping or fish mouthing as you take out the probe and there is leakage from it. Whereas, uh, and it is very circular and well circumscribed, something like this. So, uh, commenting about energy use in FICO, it must be remembered that uh, during sculpting or during chopping, if you are using more energy, it is safer because you are away from the endothelium. Whereas, during quadrant removal, if you are using more energy, you are closer to the endothelium and more damage can be done. And it, it makes sense if there is a very hard nucleus to break it into smaller chips, whereas in a relatively soft nucleus you can go with a four quadrants and you can emulsify it very fast. So it is not the total amount of energy delivered into the anterior chamber which is important, but it is the amount of energy which is delivered closer to the endothelium which is more important in terms of endothelial damage. For wound burn, of course, it's a different ball game. Uh, so uh, with that, we complete the uh, instruction course and it's open for a panel discussion. If you have anything to comment, then we'll take the questions. Sayan, so what is the... May I start? <laughs> so uh, have you uh, done, uh, I mean, uh, operated or uh, with the Constellation FECO? Yes, I have. So, have you used the Venturi uh, effect of the constellation during FECO? No, no, they don't, didn't show me Venturi. Okay. So I mean, I just wanted to know whether, because I haven't used the Stellaris, I mean, I wanted to know whether, I mean, they are equally good. See, it's interesting because I use, in alternate cases, I use a Venturi, Stellaris, and the next case is a Infinity Peristaltic. Overall, I find no difference in terms of safety. The only thing is, it feels like uh, getting down from, let's say, uh, a high-ended car to an uh, ambassador. So, infinity seems a little, little slower because uh, the parameters are not matched. If you are using a 500 vacuum on a Stellaris, it's safe. If you are using a 500 vacuum on an infinity, it's relatively unsafe. So, my infinity setting compared to a 500 in a Stellaris would be 350 in infinity. So, it's probably not fair to compare the two. But then you would I'm not dare... I'm talking about the Venturi effect in the constellation. No, table. Venturi effect in constellation I have not used. See, Venturi is Venturi, Peristaltic is Peristaltic. Mm -hmm. 
you will keep hearing these things from the company people that ours is a venturi but it simulates a peristaltic ours is a simulated venturi ours is a no, simulated not a peristaltic simulated venturi what they so, say it's they use the gas for the i mean for the venturi effect okay then it's a venturi pump yeah, yeah it's a venturi pump maybe mm. yeah So, Raghu, would you like to say something? I think you've summarized the entire plethora of uh, FICO machines with the, uh, and the and an effective comparison between the Venturi and the Peristaltic. And I think uh, the audience, I think, would be going back with a fair amount of knowledge as to which is the choice of machines. And here I would like to uh, appreciate uh, Shine also for his uh, contribution. Very practical uh, with uh, a breakdown of uh, the pros and cons of each uh, machine and their features and of course the commerce along with the science. Well done, Shine. Yang Shu. No, thank you. Any questions from the audience? So, uh, thank you everybody for attending. Okay, you have a question. Now, in case of angle closure glaucoma, we get corneal edema. And once we lower, reduce the pressure, the corneal edema clears. Now, if um, I'm uh, using a bottle height of 100 cc or something like that, surgery time, say, 35. 40 minutes. Will that itself, without uh, not taking consideration of other factors, will that cause corneal edema? Surgery time of? 40 minutes, 35 to 40, 40 minutes. minutes. So it, it will be, say, uh, how much intraocular pressure? About say 70, 80 millimeter of mercury for 40 minutes? You can have corneal clouding, especially because during surgery, the endothelial function is also disturbed. So the endothelial pump will not work as fast and uh, you can have corneal edema for such long duration. For 10-15 minutes of intraoperative time, uh, it should not be a problem. 40 minutes is a long time. So that, that can itself… That, that itself uh, can. The, that bottle light itself yes. can cause yes, it corneal can. edema. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So thank you everyone. Thanks to the panel, we close the discussion Thank now. You.